Hello everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Thank you to all the sponsors of our patient engagement series, including Signify Health, EY, MITRE, and Publicis Health. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from EY, Kenny O'Neill. Hi everyone, um, welcome to the um, webinar. We've got a great panel for you today. I'm really looking to um, getting into the discussion today. Uh, first of all, we're going to do some quick introductions. Um, my name, as you can see, is Kenny O'Neill. I'm a principal in UI's digital health team, um, and I focus on helping organizations think about um, the future of health and therefore the experience um, strategy and also transformation programs to deliver that. Um, I've worked in healthcare for the past kind of 12 years in different places around the world. I'm um, originally from Scotland, as you can hear by the funny accent. And um, yeah, I, I, and also on that journey, I've also been a general manager for a medicine division and um, a transformation leader for a large pair in the UK. Um, and then before that, I used to be a pilot in the Air Force, so classic career, career progression there. So I'm going to hand over to Jill. And Jill, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Thanks, Kenny. Hi, I'm Jill Waldner. I'm the Vice President of Corporate Alliances at Evidation Health. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with Evidation, Evidation's mission is to empower everyone to participate in better health outcomes. Um, and we do that with a focus on measures of health in everyday life, uh, leveraging permissioned data from individuals. Uh, prior to joining Evidation uh, this past summer, I uh, spent, um, the, I spent uh, 20 years at Eli Lilly and Company uh, where I uh, held positions kind of across uh, the value chain in, in roles from strategy and operations in, in general business. Excellent. And then to Laura next. Hi, Laura Semlings. Nice to meet you all. Um, I am from Northwell Health. I lead the digital patient experience at the health system, um, large typical um, provider in the New England area. And um, my job is to lead this, a small startup within the health system that focuses exclusively on the patient experience and bringing digital tools to help lead um, a, a better way for our patients. Thank you. Hey everybody, Joe Kavidar, uh, physician by training, professor of dermatology at Harvard Medical School and uh, chairman of the board at the American Telemedicine Association. Just a quick uh, point out that this is Telehealth Awareness Week. If you hadn't seen that, we were all over the social media channels. Telehealthaware.org, there's lots of other things that you can see and it's all um, uh, on demand. There's also a place I just would point out where people can Patients particularly can leave stories of successes in telehealth. We're capturing video stories for uh, promoting the um, advancement of telehealth. So thanks for inviting me. Yeah, great, great to have you. And um, yeah, some great um, material out there I've seen on Twitter and LinkedIn around the, the, the telehealth um, this week. And last but certainly not least, um, Daniel, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey everybody, uh, Daniel Kraft coming to you from Northern California. Um, Went to Stanford Med School, went out to where uh, Dr. Kvedar is at Harvard to do internal medicine, pediatrics, and then back to uh, California for hematology, oncology, and bone marrow transplant. But got much more involved in health innovation, Stanford's biodesign program, the world of digital health. For the last 12 years, I've chaired the uh, medicine side of Singularity University, and I've built a program called Exponential Medicine, which looks at the convergence of technologies and how we can reshape the clinician, pharma, patient experience. Um, I've recently uh, founded a platform called Digital.Health as a kind of a digital health formulary to help clinicians find the right tools for their patients. And through the pandemic, I've been the chair of the XPRIZE Pandemic Alliance and its task force looking at ways to collaborate to solve issues for this pandemic and prevent future ones. And uh, like Kenny, I like to fly, I used to be a flight surgeon in the Air National Guard. So I love the convergence of aviation and medicine. Yeah, we could, we could bore everybody for hours about that convergence, Daniel, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> So um, when we think about um, patient experience, um, in your view, what has been the issues in the past in actually delivering this kind of great patient experience? And can, can you give us some key pain points? So can I go to Joe first with that question? 
Well, you can, and, and I'm happy to answer it. It is me sort of pulling the covers back on my uh, colleagues in the provider side, though, because it, it, the simple answer is we make it difficult for anyone to get anything done, but certainly get it, make it difficult for patients, ironically, to find us, to get service from us, to um, get, get answers to their problems, et cetera. And it's very, very 20th century. I, th I think the best example is, a, and I, I'm not necessarily, again, proud of any of this, but if you call if you wanted to come see me in the office, you have to call the office and someone will call you back. You, you leave a voicemail and they'll find a spot for you. Um, I think, we'll, I'm sure we'll get to more of this, but the world changed uh, 18 months ago because we now have two channel healthcare delivery. And although we're, we're not too uh, digital first yet, we're, we're mixing in digital as we learn about hybrid and what it means. And that's very exciting. Uh, as well, and, and again, I'm sure we'll we'll have more to say on that as as the hour goes on. Yes, indeed, indeed. And Jill, obviously, you've had your 20 years of experience on the life sciences side. How how, how do you see it from that that side of the healthcare ecosystem? Yeah, and I'll, I'll touch on it, I guess, from from multiple perspectives. But I think um, what what Joe said made makes sense. I think that there's if you if you kind of zoom out even just from the provider piece and say what is the overall healthcare system that. Um, you know, has some form of role in, in, in establishing the experience for the patient. Um, there's no real clear and direct relationship between, or kind of singular relationship between the, the individual and the, and the healthcare system. Um, Joe talked about the one between the provider and the patient and what that looks like. Um, but at the end of the day, the experience is, is all of it together. Um, and there's not a common, you know, cohesive, I guess, relationship where, uh, the voice of the, the patient, uh, oftentimes from a marketing perspective, we talk about the voice of the customer and how does that, how is that heard and reflected and, and how is the experience created around that? Um, there's not a, uh, the system isn't it, it, the way it's set, set up. We don't have a good way of having a comprehensive view of the, the voice of the patient. Um, and I think, you know, uh, Joe spoke to that a little bit. I think if you, if you dig deeper into that, Joe, and talk, think about, you know, even as a person comes into um, an office, it's not just, you know, ensuring that the, the voice of the patient is heard, it's um, do we even have the right capabilities and what is the gap in an individual actually understanding and being able to identify and communicate what the what their voice really is, right? So um, I think there's also just a gap in um, compared to what our capabilities are today, how do we make sure people uh, truly understand how to identify and be aware of um, the most relevant things for their health um, and, and know how to take action, where to take action and communicate that clearly so that the system can work with them. So it's more that two-way uh, relationship and communication. Yeah, thanks, Joe. And, and it was funny, when you were talking there, the other part of this jumped into my head is um, that, that is not the patient experience is actually, when we think about it holistically, we also have the informal caregiver, informal caregiver experience that is tied to the patient. I don't know, and Laura, would you? I saw you nodding your head there. Would you add anything to that? It's funny you say that. That was exactly what was going through my head as Jill was talking. <laughs> you know, I think our, you know, there's two things that have been pain points over, you know, the history of of patient experience, and one is that we think uh, oftentimes of encounter by encounter rather than that more longitudinal experience of a patient is having. And even inside of a single day, when we really take a step back and understand how that patient is flowing through our care model, it's not just the patient that's flowing through the care model. It's the patient, it's the patient's caretakers. It's the, you know, the other, the other providers that are also providing, you know, the care just before and the care just after. And then all of the different, um, you know, sort of points of, of, of data and results and images and all of those other things that really need to come together to really render a real experience for the patient. And I think that's where we become most challenged as a health system because our data doesn't flow that way. Um, one, and then two, I think we don't necessarily um, really know um, all of the things that we need to know about a patient in terms of how they want to receive that information and who needs to receive that information in order for be it to be um, best utilized. And I think those are all of the things that, you know, quite frankly, really came to, um, you know, the, the ugly head during, during COVID, because when you're dealing with these things, um, you know, somewhat in isolation and trying to sort of make iterative progress, it's, 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 you know, easier to, um, to ignore the, 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 the pain point, um, or deal with it a little bit more over time and, and, and with a little bit more, um, patience, 
but really the last year and a half has has exposed um, these gaps in a, in a much more significant way. Yeah, indeed. And, and just um, Daniel, would you add anything on top of what's been said? Yeah, we live in this magical age. Many fields have gotten to the fourth industrial age. Uh, medicine still seems stuck in the second or third. I had my own patient experience about a year ago. I got a cardiac study in the Stanford system, and the only way I could get my my echo data was on a CD-ROM with my name scribbled on it. I don't even own the CD-ROM player anymore, as an example. Um, and, uh, you know, no one really wants the data, which is still quite fragmented and hard to reach. It's getting a bit better. Uh, we want the insights that are actionable for the individual. And that means presenting it to them in a way that matches their age, their culture, their language, uh, et cetera. And so uh, we talk about precision personalized medicine. We don't need to think of precision personalized, you know, digital interface with how to interact and, and meet people where they are, including how they don't just get the data, but the, you know, the, the information that's going to move them to better proactive prevention and well and wellness to earlier diagnostics to more tuned feedback, data driven uh, therapy. So. Lots of challenges, but lots of opportunities. And, and I think we don't need to reinvent anything. It's more about connecting the dots and aligning the incentives amongst the very sort of fragmented, misaligned uh, systems. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I completely agree with those comments. And it's funny, um, Joe touched on this already, but we've been through the past 18 months, uh, you know, an experience no like um, any other. Um, and I, I'd ask the question, uh, you know, how has COVID driven patient experience further up towards the top of the agenda. I'd, lo I'd love Laura to start with this because obviously you've been embedded within the front line of a provider during this um, you know, period. And I'd love to get your insights on that. Yeah, so as I started to say, I mean, I think COVID really brought um, some of the pain points that we've been talking about trying to invest in more deliberately and carefully um, straight to the top of the agenda. And Northwell was at the epicenter of you know, COVID um, and the pandemic in, in, in so many different ways, um, you know, privileged to care for literally uh, hundreds of thousands of patients um, in and around COVID, um, dealing with, you know, standing by the side of, of, of the state as we um, stood up uh, stand, you know, standalone hospitals in, 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 in places that were not meant to be hospitals and, and, and standing those up with, with, um, physicians and care teams, um, all without visitors at patient side, um, as we already started to talk about, you know, patients typically come in and those, those individuals that come in with our patients are part of their care team. Um, in a lot of ways, they are part of their communication pipes um, and, and, and their voice when they're in the hospital and not having that um, really challenged our nurses to step into very, very different roles during, during this care process. So, um, you know, and that was that was all during the height and the and, right. and the peak when our when our hospital system was, you know, for all intents and purposes, um, you know, overrun with 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 patients. As we started to emerge from that, it really became a different challenge. How do we get those ambulatory patients back in um, to our doors, make the care safe um, for patients so that there there's not um, care avoidance, and and starting to figure out. Um, do, do we have the right tools to communicate with our patients that we're open and we're safe? And 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 how do you, how do you check in safely? How do you um, stop the um, you know the thoughts around waiting rooms going to be a place of 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 vulnerability as opposed to a place of safety and security for the care that I need? Um, and and so all of these things, access to um, being able to schedule vaccination appointments at scale without having to wait on the telephone for hours and hours and hours or know exactly when visits were going to open up. These were things that, you know, we didn't have the luxury to do with just bodies because those bodies were deployed caring for patients. And so we had to figure out how to leverage and quickly put in tech that we didn't have. And, and I think what's interesting is everybody is talking about telehealth. And yes, that was something that we absolutely had to do more of and the reimbursement models blew up and opened and made it something that we could deliver. But telehealth in isolation was one, yeah. one little piece of what got done in health systems related to how digital started to play in, how experience started to change. And, and I do believe it's going to become a cornerstone and a part of how we care for patients tomorrow. But, um, you know, I think I think a lot of times when we talk about only telehealth, we really sub optimize um, the conversation of, of the change that really got started during COVID because it was much, much broader than that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Joe, obviously, you've, you've probably seen different examples at national scale. What would you add to what um, Laura has been saying? 
No, I, I fully agree. I, I often say the same thing by just telling people that having a video call with your doctor should be the floor, not the ceiling, right? It's a, it's a yeah. starting point for us to do more innovation. The gift is that now patients 201, when I mentioned to them, we could do your follow-up by telehealth. They know what I'm talking about, right? It's mm. that's that's a big deal. Uh, whereas we used to spend 10 minutes explaining what this thing was, and it's a little bit like Skyping with your grandchildren and so forth. No, you don't have to do that anymore. So it's it's a fundamental building block. Um, and, and the other thing I'll say about video which shouldn't be interchangeable, but has become interchangeable with, with the word telehealth, is that it's not really particularly efficient. It, in some ways, it's a little less efficient. So we have to think about using tools that are what I call one-to-many, where your, your healthcare providers spread across populations of patients who, and then manage by exception, manage when they're needed. Um, and that's, again, a long ways from video visits with your doctor agree with with Laura important as it was and it's incredibly it was a lifesaver literally for three months but uh, people have kind of skewed it now and thought well that's we're done with that mm -hmm. right uh, and it should be just the beginning yeah very much so it's funny what, what we are seeing nationally is also that um it, it highlighted the, the point solution limitations so a lot of people have different point solutions and, and, and suddenly the conversations have changed to what is the platform of capabilities going back to what Laura was saying. I need a suite of capabilities across my care continuum. So actually, how do I stitch that together? Because that's what's scalable. That's what's going to help us change the care model and make it, you know, business as usual, longer term, which is interesting. And, and Jill, I mean, from Evidation's point of view, um, how did the pandemic hit you? Have you seen more demand for for work around patient experience? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that there's definitely, uh, it's hitting in a lot of different ways. I think there's one which is, I think the patient experience going forward is gonna feel different. And so how do we make sure we understand what that looks like um, and how we uh, you know, continue to evolve uh, various kind of solutions in, in uh, terms of how, how people think about interacting with healthcare, the healthcare system going forward. Yeah. And Daniel, would you add anything else? I mean, with the XPRIZE work you've been doing, experience has to be a big part of that. Well, I mean, one of the XPRIZES we ran was a $6 million XPRIZE for fast, frequent, cheap and easy COVID testing, since that's been such a challenge. It's yeah. still not cheap and easy, even in the US right today. Uh, we had like 700 teams from 77 countries come with some pretty amazing innovations, some PCR based, others using some smell to, uh, to breath. Um, and ideally, these technologies, you know, will, you know, snap into your smartphone of the future with a cartridge for the next virus or non-infectious disease and really accelerate what we can do with telehealth. I mean, I think I want to go beyond the tele piece. I mean, talking to your clinician is helpful, but I think that's going to get blended with, you know, the home diagnostics, whether it's a connected blood pressure cuff or scale or all the digital exhaust from your wearables that hopefully should feed in there before the exam happens. Or in many cases, uh, you know, you get up leveled when appropriate. There's platforms uh, using, you know, chatbots, which are getting smarter and smarter. They're going to know you if you've got abdominal pain. Uh, it'll know whether you had your appendix out or whether you're pregnant, and and it'll put it in context and then triage you to the ER, to the to your clinician or somebody else. So I think that we need to go beyond sort of the telepiece and think about connecting all those dots because um, right now it does seem kind of you know screen to screen. Um, and the patient experience might be different and more continuous if we use some of the digital touch points, digital empathy. Even if your clinician isn't really texting you, it's the it's the robot that can help people stay more engaged in their adherence or their prevention uh, or public health measures. So lots of opportunity uh, if we leverage the, the connectivity. Yeah, so staying with you, Daniel, if we think about that kind of five years down the road, what, what does it look like for the patient experience? You know, what, what's that? What's that kind of journey look like for the, the individual when we start getting this right? Well, COVID's certainly been a catalyst. Uh, you know, it's a crisis, but it's also uh, bringing us a hopefully a new health age, which people experience telemedicine. They, uh, they're experiencing uh, home diagnostics. I think hopefully in five years, you know, we've talked, there's a lot of talk about hospital to home or hospital to home hospital. We'll think <laughs> more about our, our home environments, our connected lives. Often, you know, the fact that Apple and Google and Samsung and Amazon are all getting into health means that we'll have the opportunity in our consumer side to always be, if we want to, touching health in a way that is meaningful for us. Um, 
not just get bugged every 10 minutes by your by your smartwatch team to stand up one that really understands you your nudges that match your personality type um, that will have a bit of a personal integrated dashboard uh, we maybe need to reinvent HIPAA to pull all these data streams in again so that individual can own their data share it I think this whole will be a crowdsourcing I always use the example of a Google Maps or ways for healthcare to sort of understand where you are in your healthcare journey and to learn from others and to continually tune that so in five years hopefully it'll be you almost your own sort of health bubble, maybe the equivalent of your personal chatbot or avatar that really guides you, you know, again, hopefully for, for prevention, but can help you uh, pick up a disease early based on your digital exhaust or your voice or your connected toilet. Uh, and then on the therapeutic side, you know, brings in the, the, the best of telehealth and in-person health uh, and social, because health is social. Folks can meet together virtually or online to help manage their diseases, share information. And we have a bit of a learning engine that doesn't take the classic 17 years from publication to bedside or website. So lots of possibilities. A lot of that is not the technology. It's the design thinking. It's the incentives. It's the regulation. And it's, it's collaboration uh, and not, uh, not the silos that we still sadly live in today. Yeah. And Joe, what would you add to that? On top of what Daniel was saying. Only that five years in healthcare is, is a short time and things, things don't change uh, all that rapidly. Unfortunately, I used to say five years and things that I would say were 10 to 15 years out. And so uh, that's the only caveat I have is it, 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 it there are a couple of things that could really tilt. One is how much we absorb the concept of value-based payments. Uh-huh. The more that we do that, the more this, all this stuff will flow together because the incentives change dramatically. Again, we've been talking about value based for about a dozen years and not much has moved. But if that is a tipping point of some sort, then that that will make a big difference. Um, The other thing that I think is interesting about where we are is on the one hand, we we sort of Laura hinted at it. I think it um, as as providers, we have so much incentive to bring people back into our brick and mortar right now. Uh Facility fees, filling beds. We. For the first time in history, I think many of us feel that the brick and mortar is more of a, um, uh, 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 it's like a noose around our neck as opposed to what we do. And you look at Amazon and Best Buy and CVS now, and they're all kind of coming after primary care. So to the degree that people that are senior in these organizations can um bite the bullet because remember that the reimbursement path for telehealth and digital health is not clear yet. Yeah. So we're going to, in some ways you're asking your CFO not to buy an MRI magnet, which we know will be very profitable and invest in this digital first future when we don't even know how we're going to get paid for it. It's a big challenge actually. Yeah. That's a huge challenge. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's that kind of just have faith, you know, come with us on the journey. That's going to happen. I think there's, uh, we also see it, the consumer side. The consumers have suddenly woken up and went, "Wait a minute, you know, mm-hmm. this is going, this is going to pull me, and this is this is the capability I want to actually live my life because it's like everything else in my life at this time." And then, you know, I think the other thing we're seeing is that the the, ro- the role of the chief experience officer in a provider landscape. Um, you know, uh, to be frank, you know, it was like the chief innovation or chief experience officer was one person that sat in the office and didn't really have a team behind them. It was kind of like the, the tick box in the past. I mean, Laura, how do you see that role evolving within this kind of new landscape? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of different things going on. You know, I think it's changed in a couple of different areas. It's not just the chief experience officer. I mean, here at Northwell, we've got a chief, you know, we've got the chief experience officer. We've got myself, which really plays the role of chief digital experience digital, officer, which yeah. in a lot of, you know, regards is really all about digital transformation. And then you've got the evolving and changing role of, of, IT in an organization and and what is that going to look like tomorrow so you know I definitely don't have a magic you know crystal ball that's going to tell me you know how each of these individual roles are going to gather but go together but I think that there's really two things that I think are going to be imperatives right one is collaboration you know the 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 act of of um digital is is really to break down those silos that Daniel you you really started to you know sort of bring out the silos of information when 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 you look at the the industries that have been completely and radically transformed by digital it's ones that really understood their customers and understood the data points that were 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 able to to make change um and to drive efficiencies and to drive surprise and delight and to drive 
better outcomes. And in our world, it's 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 not about um, you know dr driving. It, it is about driving surprise and delight, but hopefully, it's more about population health and outcomes and and healthier people um, at the end of the day. So, how do we move that data not just within our health systems but beyond, so that we have this ecosystem? of care and, and knowledge about patients that is meaningful to engage them differently, to drive them to, you know, in some cases, make better choices, in other cases, to adhere, in other cases, to, you know, to act when they, they maybe didn't act because they didn't have a, you know, a trigger point or didn't understand what maybe was going on with them clinically to, to move fast enough. And so that's the opportunity I see. So where's the experience officer in that? Um, I think it's in driving investment and and real deliberate utilization of things that have never been important to healthcare. It's that space in between clinical and getting paid for care. It's that CRM space that, you know, really other industries have invested in tremendously in tremendously, but you know, in, in, in traditional healthcare, that's been the role of individual providers, right? Um, to get to know your patient. And that's been the magic of of a really great provider compared to a provider who was just, you know, just okay. Well, now when you're in, in this ecosystem, it, it, it can't be the great. It's got to be in every, you know, in every single environment. We need to know that patient deeply and on different dimensions than we ever did before to be able to do any of the things we're talking about. So I, I think I think the role of that chief experience officer is going to be one um, that really digs in on data using analytics, metrics, um, tools to be able to get to know that customer, not just in terms of acquisition, but retention and driving outcome. And that's, you know, that's that's gonna be a totally different role than it is today where it's been um, far more um, what I, you know, what I would consider delivering on some of the softer points of experience. Yeah, and, and just, just to take that a little bit further, do, do you see a real appetite change and in, in actually, you know, human, true, true human centered design and ethnographic research within the health systems, your health system or other health systems? Because to be honest, in the past, I feel as if it's been paid lip service a little bit, but I've seen a, a kind of a bit of a change. I mean, I'd love your experience about what you're seeing. Just in terms of, um, say more a little bit about the question. I'm not sure I understood well, exactly well, what you're trying to um, there. So when we're thinking about the experience in digital, it, it, in the past, a lot of it's been, well, we know, we know what the patient wants kind of idea yeah. but actually some um, people are getting much deeper into the concepts of design thinking human-centered design ethnographic research got 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 where you're going i'm sorry yeah. um for, for asking for clarification there no absolutely i think you know one of the one of the cornerstones of the digital experience we're doing now is who are you as a patient and mm. and what do we need to know about you forget uh, you know who we think you are you tell us and i'll, I'll give you a silly little example but one is um you, you know, what is it that you really think as your provider is treating you clinically that that provider needs to know about you as, as a person? And, and why is that important? And why are you, why are we asking is, is really served up to our patients in a really crisp and easy way. But then from there, how do we serve it up to the provider so that they know what is important to this patient and it can become a topic of, of conversation for them and help in their care plan? So that's a, that's an example where it's not this, what I'm going to call massive um, research process. It's, it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation digitally with a patient about what's important with you. And so the how we collect information goes from a many-to-one down to an individual, very personalized, giving us an ability to start to really curate care plans, conversations, relationships that feel far more personal and, um, you know, just, just, just viable, right? It gives, yeah. it, it gives a viability to this and a life that doesn't feel like, like lip service. Um, and so where that goes from here, I'm not entirely sure, you know, it's everything from preferences of how, how and where you want your care to, you know, how do you want to be communicated? Who's in your care team, all of these things infused in a way that is that is that is not macro, um, but really personal and and contributes to curation. And I hope that answers your question. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, so so thinking about and we've all touched on it, but um, this future experience uh, needs a suite of digital technologies to deliver to enable that fundamental different way 
of um, delivering patient experience and care. Um, so we've talked about telehealth, but what do you see as the emerging technologies that are truly going to, you know, not in wide use just now, but are actually coming to the fore that are going to um, drive this fundamental change? And I'd like to start with Jill, please. Yeah, and and I've enjoyed this everything everyone's saying and, and completely aligned. I think that um, in, to some extent we've all sort of touched on this question throughout the answers. Um, I, I think the 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 key piece in terms of where is the opportunity for the most significant impact in the future. I think it all comes from from the data and how are we leveraging uh, and pulling harnessing the, the data together to get to the individual insights as as Daniel mentioned. And I think a lot of that comes from, and, and, and Laura mentioned this as well, is how are we getting to um, a point where we're able to engage with the individual on a regular basis throughout their day-to-day -day life and understand that individual through their day-to-day -day life. Um, Daniel mentioned you know, a couple of the technologies as we look kind of further into the future, like connected toilets, which I haven't heard of that one yet, but um, that, that I'm sure that can capture some interesting data. Um, but you know, there's, there's, I think there's even opportunities today that we're not fully leveraging. Um, there's ways you can engage with people and get both passive and active information that can help fill a lot of the gaps that we have today with simply a phone, um, which the majority of adults, 90 over 97% of adults have a phone, right? And so I think that there's some um, really big gaps in uh, Ultimately, how do we better understand individuals and understand them in a way that we can create solutions and, and really empower them to fully own their health, have the insights that they need that are most relevant to them so that they take the right action. Um, I think a lot of that can be done with data that can be captured from um, you know, technologies that are broadly used today. Um, I guess I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, uh, no, I, I, I totally agree. And there's also the recognition that what sits in the healthcare sector, the classic healthcare sector just now is only 20% of the data that keeps you well. We don't truly have the 40% of the social behavioral, the environmental, yes. you know, the 40, 30, 20, um, 10 model. Um, so I, I'd love, um, you know, just taking this further, Joe, what, what's your, your view on this? Something I've thought about for, for many, many years, and we, we used to do all kinds of experiments and pilots in this uh, space. I, I think at some point, and there's a few companies out there that are very early stage that are working on this, so maybe one of them will be successful, but at some point that vision will come to pass that um, some system, I'm, I'm gonna come back to what I, why I said it that way, will know you so well that it can predict your behavior and and will know enough about what motivates you that it can motivate you to to be uh, on a path to health. Right now, it's I guess your health plan would care about that. Maybe your employer would care about that. Your provider would not, because we still make a living taking care of sick people. And we just and I go back to value based reimbursement again. We just haven't crossed the Rubicon where we financially care for all that stuff. Of course we care that you're healthy or not. We, we're deeply concerned with our patient's health, but to get there, we think of the things that we can do to help you when you're sick. And that's just the way that it is. And it's a classic challenge. I, that's not news to anyone here on, on the panel or, or on the, in the audience, but I only bring it up because all of the richness of data that we can get on people, all the data processing we can do, other industries have done it. We, that's a theme that's come up before. We can gather information, collate it, use AI to predict the future. Until there's a business model around it, it's just sort of a curiosity. Yeah. Daniel? Well, one business model, I mean, that sometimes there are, there's a failure of alignments uh, or business models. I, I was on a call about a month ago with uh, the White House, and there's this new platform called ARPA-H that's being proposed, kind of a DARPA for, for healthcare. And part of what we talked about um, even, uh, you know, is how do we integrate all these new data sets, make sure they're shared. There's all the new ways to share data, synthetic data, uh, new platforms that can hopefully really build that sort of real-time Google Maps or ways for health that can be even globalized. Um, and so maybe it sometimes it might take the, the, the federal level or even international to bring some of those things to bear. I mean, just think, imagine if we had sort of a, a better uh, early warning system for the next pandemic that would, prevent it in the first place. So I think there's tons of possibilities. 
And it means not just always thinking about tra traditional um, health measures. I mean, in this age of digital health and apps, et cetera, there are still under development apps that can listen to your cough and pick up COVID versus croup or common cold. Mm -hmm. Maybe those will be biomarkers. Um, uh, mm -hmm. There's the era of invisibles. Your laptop camera that I'm on right now can start to pick up heart rate, blood pressure, maybe mm -hmm. even blood sugar. And maybe those will be signals that can be crowdsourced. Just like there's a, a company called Kinsa Health, which can crowdsource temperatures and predict where the COVID pandemic is going days before the CDC. So lots of new um, forms of data that can turn into actionable information if we can cross fertilize and sometimes that might take, take higher level uh, instigation. So, yeah. so, so if I might pick up on two points that you just made, Daniel, that I think are really critical. Sometimes I think it's in the, in the less, um, less magical um, things that make some of these things actionable, right? And, and I think one of the things that every health system, everybody involved in healthcare really spends a ton of time in is identifying and de-identifying patients, um, you know, in terms of data. And, you know, actionable, actionable insights come from, do you know who this person is and can you reach them and can you reach them in a meaningful way? And I think, you know, today we have struggles inside of my own system, you know, you know, with our enterprise master patient identifier, we've got five. Um, and, and so, you know, when, when we talk about like what we could be doing as, as an ecosystem of care, I really do think it, it, it is, you know, kind of bringing the social security number of, of healthcare back so that there is a thread that makes so much of what we, you know, struggle with continuous and knowing when it's, you know, to share that in an identified versus a de-identified way. Obviously there's privacy security and all of those other things, but it goes back to HIPAA. Like how are we taking one human who is not a different human when they show up for care at a different place or a different service or a different function? Like this comes back to table stakes. If that, if, if we don't know who you are, we cannot do anything with the insights. Um, and, and so I think it goes way, way back, back to who the individuals are first. The, the second thing that I think about, you know, related to emerging technologies, again, other com uh, other industries have done this, orchestration and awareness. Like, how are we communicating with you? Do we know how many times we have? Everything we want is around digital first, right? But we don't have the tools and the, um, you know, technologies at our, at our fingertips today to be able to do that elegantly. How do you digitally engage once rather than with every program or every device or everything that you need? How do we um, know that you got a text message about, a, you know, a survey and, um, you know, some program that you're in, plus, you know, you've got an image and a lab result. You're getting five different pings. How do we organize that in a better way? I think those are going to be the less sexy things that really drive the most change inside of that time frame you gave us in the next five years. Those are things we're going to be borrowing and applying that are gonna drive some real in situ, um, I think, experience for patients, practical. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of change, I, I have a, a, a request. Um, uh, I, everyone always asks about privacy and privacy is king. And maybe it's different if you're in a GDPR company, country or Asia, but data is the new oil and people often can't share it or healthcare startups and others are hindered by HIPAA, which is supposed to be for healthcare portability. It's, it's well-meaning, I think, but it was, written primarily before the digital age. And now mm -hmm. I think it hinders a lot of the ability to, to share information. Lots of patients have died with their privacy intact. I think they'd probably rather be alive. Maybe, Joe, do you have any uh, insights on how to sort of just railing against it, shift that and get the regulators to reimagine it for our digital world? Not really, I'm sorry, but I hate to be uh, 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 let you down, but I, I think it's a, yeah, it's a problem. You've stated it incredibly well. Uh, if you think about the, legislative priorities right now. Um, we can't even get them to think about the uh, Medicare originating site rule, which is more acute than HIPAA, but HIPAA is on the list. It's just unfortunately down, down the bottom, I, I think. Sorry to be a, a, a killjoy or a buzzkill. Hopefully that's- uh, Someone hopefully out there can please get, for it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Hopefully we can get more people talking about it and create momentum for these webinars. Um, I suppose moving on uh, to, to our last question today, um, it concerns he health equity. So, you know, we're finally talking about health equity in a much more open way. Um, so what role do you see patient experience and the enabling technologies that we've talked about up until this point actually helping to eliminate those disparities in healthcare? And if I could start, start with Laura and then I'll go to you after that. Yeah, so Jill mentioned this earlier, you know, yeah, I think it's the number of uh, adults in our in our country is like 97% have a telephone in their hand, um, a smartphone in their hand. 
And so I, I, th I think never um, have we had a better opportunity to start to align around technology to be able to reach populations we couldn't reach before. Um, and I think it really does come down to, you know, having information about what the needs are and getting way more sophisticated about giving patients the opportunity um, to raise their hand, um, to be able to know um, that there, there are opportunities to be able to provide you care differently um, and, 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 and meeting, re reaching people where they're at. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the interesting things, you know, we've got tons of programs um, here, as I, I would imagine you would think as, as a health system of our size. And, and one of the things um, we're doing a lot of is, is, is starting to use texting to reach those populations and telehealth to reach populations mm -hmm. um, of care that can't come in for that care. And, and, and silly little things get in the way of, of you know, digital, right, um, and, and accessibility. And one I'll just highlight for you is just the cost of texting. You know, we don't think, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you don't think about, um, you know, the patient who every couple of cents really, really matters. Um, yeah. And messages that you get charged for, you know, by segments of data, as opposed to, um, you know, the actual literal text message. You might get three or five or 10 in a, in a blitz just to let you know you have a reminder. Well, those are the very things that I think we're going to have to think really, really carefully about as we start to think about things so that patients don't disengage before they engage because of that, you know, that 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 ping on the wallet, because the wallet becomes far more important in a lot of these. The other thing I'll just mention is just, you know, equity comes in a lot of different ways um, and 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 you know, accessibility of, of technology opens doors for patients, whether you're talking about, you know, screen readers for patients who, um, you know, don't have the ability to, to see, whether you're talking about, um, you know, the ability to use keyboards for patients who can't speak. Um, you know, it really opens up doors, but you have to put those um, very discrete capabilities and features and, and, and functions in. People, you know, we live in um, one of our markets is it has the highest number of languages in the entire country. I believe the last count was 267 dialects of Chinese are spoken here in the in 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 Queens. And that's just Chinese. If you add yeah. on all of the other languages. And so so just pure and simply the language that you speak and being able to translate, um, you know, our digital content into these words. These are ways to reach populations we have never reached before um, yeah. in really, really meaningful ways. Yeah, and um, Joel, I mean, what would you add on top of what Laura said? Um, she, you've said it quite well. I, I guess I'd just highlight a couple of things. One is 97% is, um, phone doesn't mean 97% data plan. So just always advocating for more broadband. Broadband should be a common utility, just like the road in front of my house here. Uh, some progress is being made, but it's not fast enough, and that's really important. And the flip side is uh, continued support for audio-only telehealth, because again, that's a digital divide crossing tool that we can use today, uh, but pretty much everyone who pays for care is threatening to take it away. So just to advocate for that. Yeah. And I mean, Daniel, you, you talk about this from the kind of digital determinants of health point of view. What would you add to this? Well, I mean, just like digital health doesn't mean you can give someone a Fitbit and they'll lose weight. You can't just give someone a smartphone, um, but they all could use, uh, you know, we talk about the social determinants, the digital determinants, meaning do they have access to internet, whether even high speed or low speed so their kids can go to Zoom school. Um, many parts of rural U.S. have very limited even cell phone coverage and we have, you know, SpaceX has launched Starlink that might open up. Uh, the lower the digital divide in terms of access to, to, to internet and, band, and bandwidth. So those are pieces. And of course, you know, dialects, language, culture, the, U, the UI for these different health apps and many health systems have their own could be a, a adopted and, and optimized. So they're not one size fits all. Even, you know, my Fitbit or, or Whoop has pretty good UI, but it's still the same for almost all of us. And we have different incentives. Some want to save dollars, some want badges, some want social cred. There might be ways to, again, build in the gamification for healthcare and certain components as well that, that help minimize that divide and have uh, uh, you know leaders that look like them uh, integrated into their uh, care. And Jill, from the work Evidation does, are you seeing um, the ability to actually you know hit some of these pain points around health equity? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a couple of things. I agree with everything that everyone has, has said so far. I think, um, you know, there's certainly, uh, 
push on our end, and I think we've got good representation in our overall achievement population that says that, you know, how do we make sure that we're, we're uh, reaching the right individuals? I think a big piece of it too is, um, it kind of goes back to understanding the kind of the voice of the individual and how do you make sure that you're uh, capturing the right information so that you know um, how to engage the person and where to go to engage them. Um, so a little bit, you know, and Laura says you have to go to where the, you have to go to where the person is. So to the extent that you are um, capturing information, permission by the person where you can understand them from a day-to-day -day perspective as an individual beyond just as a patient, um, it gives you the ability to um, actively engage them and, and empower them to, to own their health. Okay, thanks, Jill. And Laura, yes. Yeah, just one more point on what Jill said. I think the other thing we're really dabbling in now is how do you give the person on the other end, now you know where the patient is, how do you give the provider the next best action based on that knowledge point. Because, you know, I think one, one area where we've fallen down in the past is, you know, social determinants of health is a really great example of where you've got a form, you're collecting a lot of information. That information has historically been put on the provider to collect, but there's never really been a resource that says, okay, if you get this, this set of answers, here's what you can provide to that patient in terms of resources and next best actions, connecting, you know, the data collection with the, with the, you know, opportunities for next best, you know, the next best thing to do to avoid or to promote health. That's, that's where this stuff really starts to become magical. Um, and, and, you know, I, that's so, so, so I think those two things combined really start to change, to start to evoke change. Great. Thanks very much. So now we're going to move into the Q&A part of this um, webinar. So I'm just going to see the first question we've got comes from Ak Akshaya. And I'm really sorry if I mispronounced your um, surname, Viswanathan. Fingers crossed I got that right. Um, can you please explain how commercial players such as Amazon, CVS, would turn, the prime, would turn to primary care delivery? How would it be five or 10 years from now, giving their fixed fee payment model and the scale that they cover? So can we go to Joe first, because you're the one that kind of mentioned the, those players in the market, and then we'll open up to the panel. Well, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. I, I guess I would say uh, don't underestimate their capabilities. That's the first thing I would say. And many people, again, I always come back because I, I probably listen to the most to and hear the most from my colleagues in the provider sector. So I, I'm, I'm uh, a victim of that. But that a lot of them will blow this off that, oh, Google just got out of health. You know, health is hard. And uh, well, we're, we're actually, I think we're gonna get pantsed by them, frankly. Um, and it's because they do things really well on the consumer side and we don't. And I said that earlier is we just kind of expect you to put up with a lot and they expect to uh, bring things directly to you. So they can hire doctors, they can do all the things that we do and they're not encumbered by the brick and mortar. I'll say that again, they'll just set up partnerships with companies like Laura's or mine or what have you. And, and, uh, when, and when those people need uh, those brick and mortar uh, um, services, they'll, they'll send them on to us. So I, I, th I think they're formidable. I would, agree. I would say don't underestimate Amazon. I talked to Babak Parviz who runs Amazon Care a few months ago. They're going to be rolling out to 50 states. They've already piloted systems for their employees in the Seattle area where you text the problem, you chat bot, they might send someone to your home to do the diagnostics. And then of course right. the medications through Amazon Pharmacy can arrive. So talk about customer, understand the customer and, and UI and seamlessness, uh, don't estimate them at all. And I think that they get rid of a lot of the friction, you know, that a bit of that Uberization mm -hmm. of healthcare is, is coming. And so a lot will happen in the next five years in that space. Yeah. I've got to drop everybody. So thanks for having me and yeah. keep going. With Thank you, Daniel. Thanks yeah. very much. Um, Laura or Joe, would you add anything to this? Question? Yeah, I think the only the only other thing I would add to that is just the you know, just the cost of care when you cream off primary care, um, oh. and 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 you leave you sort of saddle um, you know the big sort of brick and mortar operation with the you know the the the, the highest cost of, of of the equation. And so this is something I think as a nation we're going to really have to think about carefully. I, I, you know, I think they're you know going to be a huge part of 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 the tomorrow. But I think how how this ecosystem looks and feels differently with 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 primary care becoming you know I, I hate to put this word on it but I do think some of it is a, is about anonymity um mm. and and continuity at the same time but mm. but when it's like bringing bringing back the most expensive most tragic most high needs patients at a point where they're least known or they're most distributed I think that's going to be really an, an interesting thing to watch and figure out how how we bring that together 
um, for the patient because it, it, it's going to create new and different challenges for us financially Absolutely. as yeah. well as, you know, from an experience perspective. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Joe, anything to add to that? Did you say Jill or Joe? Jill? Sorry, Jill. <laughs> Scottish <laughs> accent, that's what it is. Right. Uh, you can just pretend. Right, go ahead. Don't yeah. <laughs> I'll speak for on Joe's behalf. Um, I, I mean, I think, you know, what a lot of what we've talked about today, a couple of things, a lot of what we've talked about today is sort of the gap in, in understanding the individual and engaging the individual. Look, uh, clearly Amazon knows how to, to do that. And I've got a million packages outside my door every day that kind of prove that. Um, so, so I think there, there, there's something there that, that can certainly be, be learned and, and, and leveraged. Um, I think that, uh, the other piece is just the, the overall, um, I lost my train of thought, the overall kind of engagement. And um, when we think about, uh, Laura, I th think about what I'm sure what you're saying is sort of the continuity um, for an individual, where does that ultimately come from and how can we leverage um, the personal generated data, right? So today we've got a lot of systems that have all the data and we're trying to figure out how to stitch that together. What's the right balance and how do we leverage um, you know, data that's generated by the individual or medi mediated by the individual to help create that continuity. I think if you start to look in the consumer world, that's a lot of what's happening. Um, and so I think, you know, what's to be learned from that? Yeah. Um, I, I, and Laura, I don't think it's just providers that are worried about this. When you think of the, the actuarial model of a pair, um, you know, young, healthy people pay for the 5% five, 5 cost X amount of the medics for them. So, you know, we're seeing this real fear of this disintermediation. Um, but then at the same time, if you can think about effective platforms that can connect the um, fragmented system, that's the, the kind of upside, if you'd like. But it's um, not easy, definitely not easy. And um, that comes back to what Jill was saying around, you know, these 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 patient generated um, and then and 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 sort of portals of 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 information that follow the patient that are that are agnostic of 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 a provider you know we haven't really stood up that way right we've stood up in a in a way that everybody's got their own um and you carry that own with you and then you redundantly process that over and over and over again um and i and i think we've got to move away from that model in order uh -huh. to be able to behave and 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 live in this world that's coming um and 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 i think that requires some 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 fundamental change on a, on a lot of levels and so you know, I think the people that are going to be most open to that change are they're going to be the survivors. Um, and and you know what it, what it looks like, how it looks, which tools are going to be there to do it. Um, I, I I again, I I don't have a crystal ball, but I think the survivors are going to be the ones that are open in terms of their architecture, their data flow, and that are really receptive to both patients and providers as consumers because they're both consumers in this in this process. Yeah. And I think the one we can't avoid is the employer. Um, you know, employers are, are, are as critical in this as any. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, the next, the, there's two questions I'm, I have from Greg Young and Paul Grant, and they kind of can be combined. Um, but Greg is asking about, isn't a universal patient ident identifier a fundamental priority to um, realize much of what has been talked about today? And Paul's question is um, asking about, you know, um, how do we connect both the federal and commercial system, how, how do we join it up to give this single view of the patient, you know, when the system itself might create collaborative competition and reinforce silos? So, so within, if we take the macro, how do we join up the system, you know, federal and, and commercial and the different parts, how, how do we do that? And then the, the unique identifier, how do we, how do we take that um, forward to make it easier to travel through the system as such? Um, who, who would like to start? I'll start with a brief answer because I think I think Joe and, and Laura are going to have a have a lot to add here. But I think I would just tie this back to the whole: how do you get to a beyond patient generated? Um, what we kind of refer to as patient mediated, right? So how do you empower the individual to permit to access and permission, um, you know, their data uh, to, you know, whoever's relevant, right? Because at the end of the, at the end of the day, if all of that could come back to the individual and they're able to then mediate who has access to that data, it begins to unlock a lot of this. Yeah. Um, That's like the um, Estonian system. I don't know if you know about the, 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 the whole country of Estonia is on a single health platform 
and I hold my care record on my phone. And then when I have to go and see the doctor, I give them permission to access my data, which is just, I still remember somebody showing me their care record and saying, this is exactly how it works. So yeah, it's technically possible um, to do that. I mean, Joe, Laura, would you add anything else on top of what Jill has said? Well, only that it seems like today I'm the contrary, and I, I normally I'm not, but but only would add that that um, interoperability is almost in nobody's business interest. So mm -hmm. it just becomes an enormous challenge. It's it's another one of those things. Telehealth used to be like this, where we would cheerlead for the patients wanted. It. People would say, "Yeah, but I can't really make it work business wise," and that's kind of the way interoperability is. That universal patient identifier, fabulous idea. Uh, sadly, it alone wouldn't solve these problems. It's a step. It's an important step. But you know, to the to the vision that Jill just said, where it's my data as a patient and I unlock it for those who need it. Sadly, we're far from that, and that's because everyone who owns a data store sees it as part of their um, future competitive value in healthcare uh, delivery. So, so what, what what would be you know what would be the big hitting items to? kind of break that, those walls down for you? Well, it was uh, alluded to earlier. I think maybe it was Daniel who said this, but it hinted at the fact that the government could play a role. So, huh. so we, we had, uh, for better or worse, we had high tech. We, we got everyone on electronic records through a government um, policy program. We probably could do something similar for interoperability. It would take, a, again, it takes a lot of kind of political will to move something like that forward and your big players, whether it be Epic or Cerner or even delivery systems like mine, I think it probably yours too, Laura, would say, well, we're not so sure we want interoperability. We kind of like keeping our patients' uh, data. So again, I think it's an enormous challenge. Yeah. Laura, would you add anything on top of what's been said? Yeah. I mean, I think this is the sea change that's coming. And I, I, I you know, I think the reality is it's, 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 we don't we don't know exactly how it's going to happen, but I, I I think what's going to push it are really, you know, those external non traditional players um, because I, I I think they're going to figure out a way to, um, you know, for lack of a better way of saying, commoditize this information and 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 make it meaningful to you to share um, without having regulation have to be the answer. I mean, I think we, I don't I, I don't know exactly how it's going to happen. I just I I, I foresee. That that we we can't we're not going to be able to operate the way we've operated in the past in this space and 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 putting our own walls around our, ourselves and our ecosystems because we we you know we live in an extraordinarily um, you know competitive market and we already see our patients moving from place to place and you know there are regulations that are coming out things like the Cures Act and 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 and. It intended to create some movement and of 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 that data. Um, I, I I guess I don't believe that that regulation alone is going to be able to do it. Um, and and I think it's you know I believe in the free market and I I I think that that's going to you know be a heavy pusher here. I I think patients are going to actually also be a really heavy pusher here because you know mm. at the end of the day. Um, you know, there, there is a population of people who are making their own, um, tools for, for being able to like avoid redundancy in their own care. And these tend to be your patients with the most chronic, um, diseases. We've got a lot to learn from those patients who are, you know, already figuring out how to activate their, you know, caretaker channels, how to, you know, take the information that they're asked over and over and over again, and put it in ways that they can share it so that they can just not have to repeat it time and time again for their own safety. And so what do we learn from that to be able to um, create the first generation of tools I think is going to drive um, some, some some of this future for us, um, and then all of us, you know, sort of big systems like Joe and I belong to are going to have to figure out how to receive that because if we can't receive it, they'll just go somewhere else. Yeah. They will. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the parallel of, of the patient becoming a much more informed consumer as part of this change. So, um, well, I just like to say thank you to the panel. I think it was a great discussion today. Thank you for your time, and I will hand back to the moderator.